Hello friends and family and welcome to the Monday edition of the Crippling Anxiety Meditation Conversation. Today I wanted to talk about a book that I've started reading. Uh, that book is not a meditation book, it is Poor Economics. Um, I also want to show you my friend Pop made me this pretty adorable <laughs> bookmark with a squishy bear who's wearing a scarf. He's supposed to be a Canadian bear. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see fairly early on in this book a discussion about how the poor, uh, exceptionally poor, um, respond to injections of uh, money or to subsidies. And the, the premise of the entire book is essentially that we can observe um, our economic models using scientific tools, um, specifically randomized controlled trials um, in the case of the research that was done for the book. But um, that a lot of human behavior is counterintuitive and that poor people and those in extreme poverty do not necessarily respond to the receipt of money uh, or subsidies in the way that we would expect them to. And I don't really want to linger on this idea. I, I just wanted to point it out as a, a bit of evidence, um, supporting evidence for an argument that I've been trying to make for some time, which is that we individually and collectively would probably do much better to focus on the disease rather than the symptom. And I think that one glaring example lately has been um, the focus on individual politicians. We have, as a society, for as long as there's been democracy, uh, or longer than that, we have a, a temptation to look to our leaders, liked or unliked, and to invest a lot of energy in analyzing them, analyzing their behavior, thinking about who they are and why they're doing certain things. When regardless of the structure that you happen to have as, as a nation state, The politician is always a symptom. The disease is the structure. And we don't seem to be investing a lot of energy in the disease. If it feels very clearly like a democracy has fundamental flaws that can be resolved, it feels worthwhile to explore what the resolution to those flaws might be, rather than simply trying to get away from a politician that is hated and running toward a politician who may or may not be liked, but is certainly liked better. Um, This is one easy go-to example. There are many. Um, I can think of many other examples in software systems that I've worked on, but I won't give any of those examples. Um, but in the case of uh, the research that was done here in poor economics, um, the research is about the economy, and it's quite 
narrow, but it is possible to explore and examine the behavior of those in extreme poverty. And in particular, the counterintuitive behavior that they observed in their research. When we look at money as only a symptom, so money is it is many things, right, in our world. Um, in the 21st century, we will continue to use money and it is a valuable tool for uh, a lot of what we do. It's essential for global cooperation. And it is so essential that we often forget that it is imaginary, right? There is no real set, there's no such thing as money. Um, the money that we have agreed is worth one rupee or one dollar is certainly not the uh, metal or paper representation of that thing and most money is even more imaginary than that it simply lives in uh, large databases in various financial systems and we use money as a sort of model it is a model which represents the actuality, the reality of the world around us, the actual world. And it's a valuable model. We all agree on it, more or less. There are a few outliers and people who really believe in cryptocurrency. Um, but most of us believe in money and we find value in money in the trade um, enabled by money. But when it comes to what money is in this model of the symptom and the disease, money is the symptom. The disease is well-being. And it's very difficult for us to accept that. It's very difficult for us to accept that to have a home and to have food and healthcare and education, that is well-being. That is why you have money. Those are the things you want. You don't want this abstract money, even though at present, this abstract money can almost always get you what you want. It can get you the home, it can get you food, it can get you education. Um, it's more important for us to realize that these reifications of those ideas are more valuable and that this is the actual target. And so I think that it is interesting to examine our own lives in terms of what we think we are trying to achieve what ends to which we feel we are working? And when have we really achieved those ends? How much money do we need? How much money is essential? How much money can be considered too much money? Is there such a thing as too much money? And to reframe money for ourselves like we do or like i'm suggesting we do for those in extreme poverty as a symptom money for us the presumably if you're watching this on youtube in english you are in a relatively narrow category of people actually um i mean particularly narrow in that you're my family and friends but even uh, narrow as a, a category of humans, right? Um, level four country, profitable, um, privileged, and capable of quite a lot. And for us in this very fortunate position um, that I hope we all have at least some gratitude for, for being in this position, um, because we're very lucky to be here, but for us in this position, 
it is worth examining money as a symptom, a marker. So we can look at our financial situation and the financial situation of those around us, um, our friends, our family, and say, oh, okay, finances. That is an approximation of well-being. And it often doesn't tell us much about the deeper aspects of well-being. So many people can be incredibly rich and still have depression, can be incredibly rich and still have other crippling emotional or mental, mental issues which prevent them from really enjoying real well-being. So it is certainly not the case, and we all know that money doesn't bring well-being. I'm not going to say happiness because that is a bit too abstract, right? But well-being we can sort of understand. Oh, okay, a home, food, healthy food, and people who love us, and all of these sorts of things which are essential bit of exercise now and then. Um, this is well-being, to be healthy and stable and okay in our lives. And money obviously doesn't bring us any of that, but it's an enabler. Um, but more interestingly, if we flip that equation around and we look at it in terms of what money represents, we can say, oh, okay, money represents this indicator of well-being. Is it possible for me to get a gym membership? Is it possible for me to go to university? Is it possible for me to buy the house I live in rather than rent? These are all markers of well-being. And they're valuable markers insofar as covering the material world. But as we all know, when we lie down to sleep, mostly that material world doesn't matter, including the bed. There are people in this world who sleep on the floor much more comfortably and much more happily than any of us will ever sleep in a plush, comfortable bed. And so we lie down to sleep and we close our eyes and the material world largely disappears. Um, if you live in a polluted city, there may still be dust, <laughs> as some of us know. But what we're left with is what is inside literally, right, inside this physical structure that we have to deal with every second of every day. Um, what we're putting up with whatever's going on here. Um, there, you get some real markers of well-being, right? The, your financial situation, the comfort of your house, the degree you have from which university, these are all external markers, obvious markers. And the internal markers are only really known to us. Um, once you measure them, if you measure them with an instrument, if you do an fMRI, um, you get a bunch of readings out of your uh, Apple Watch or whatever, they become external markers. Now someone else knows. Now someone else can formulate an opinion based on that limited data. But the totality of the internal data is available to you. It is fully available to you to explore. This is a system. This physical structure is a system for your exploration that you can dig into and you can investigate. And in many senses, many real senses, you can heal. And this sort of course correction, this healing um, of this system is a happy byproduct 
of the investigation itself. And this is where Anapan comes in. It is, uh, it is a boundary between the external world of finances and university degrees and the square footage of your house, the external world of your heart rate, uh, your fMRI results, <laughs> your blood test results, all these components of the external world, everything that can be measured by someone else, everything that can be measured by you and read back, and you can say, ah, yes, oh, okay, that was my heart rate. Um, the breath offers you an interesting tool, and it's very interesting in this respect, that it seems to be the only aspect of our physiology which is both conscious and unconscious. The exploration of the external world is conscious exploration. And so we consciously read our heart rate back to ourselves and we evaluate it. That's external. We're acting and we can act on the breath. So we can engage the breath. We can make it a certain way. We can will it to be a certain way. And we can engage the unconscious side of the breath. So there are a lot of other unconscious processes going on in this body, but they're very difficult to observe. Um, initially, probably impossible, right? But thanks to the breath, because it lives on both sides, it allows us to begin with the conscious external side and work our way toward the unconscious internal side, simply by observing it. When our well-being is poorly structured, when we are unwell, the aspects of the internal, the brokenness, the difficulties, um, the unhealthy habits, habit patterns, of our mind, of our body, of our physiology, they surface themselves, right? That's when we know, oh, there's a problem. Oh, I have anxiety. Oh, <laughs> I'm feeling sad for days and days and days, right? This is, this is the internal coming outside. And so then we could say, oh, okay, like I acknowledge I have a problem. There is a problem here that maybe I should deal with. And it is the reverse process to use Anapana to go back to the inside, to observe what is happening internally, is to have a look at our actual well being, our well being beneath the surface. And it is our well being beneath the surface which accumulates and accumulates our well-being for whatever value of well-being it might be good it might be bad it might be complicated but it is surfacing constantly and it surfaces as a gross emotion it surfaces as a gross thought it surfaces as uh, our behaviors right the things that we say and the things that we do um, even the, the very subtle ones. This is all a surfacing of what is going on inside of us, literally. Uh, the internal biological processes of our body. And to explore this well-being is... Uh, it's an interesting step. Because if we are to think about well... So, okay, go back to money, right? It's such an incredibly gross tool. 
for examining well-being. It's so external and it's so misrepresentative. So if we think about the kind of counterintuitive behavior that is observable in science, if we say, oh, yeah, money, like it's supposed to be the thing, right? And people don't seem to behave at all how we would expect when they have money, when they don't have money. It is because money is such a poor approximation. It is a poor symptom of our actual health, our actual well-being. It can tell us a lot about the very gross external systems. And then as we get closer to the internal, we start to explore, oh, okay, like, am I angry all the time? Am I sad all the time? Am I anxious all the time? This is still external. This is still something that we can analyze intellectually, externally. We can speak with someone else about. We can see a therapist. We can be medicated. And those may, may very well be very good choices, the right choices for a given person at a given time. Um, there are always a, a wide variety of choices available to us. Almost anything in this external sphere, um, be it therapy, be it medication, be it reading a book, be it listening to music to relax, whatever our approach to our well-being is, it can be combined with this internal approach. Um, anapan can be done largely with these activities, but even if not simultaneously, 10 minutes of anapan, uh, 10 minutes of exercise, right? These things don't need to overlap necessarily, and you'll gain the benefit of both. And you will find that at first it is not, diff it is not easy to see the markers of, um, of well-being gone awry, of something unhealthy within us, an unhealthy habit pattern, an unhealthy thought pattern that is sort of boiling away internally. But in time, you will see it in the breath. And in terms of symptom, in terms of abstraction, uh, this is the last of the gross, uh, of the external. So as we get to a point where we can view the breath, observe the breath objectively without getting involved, without controlling the breath, and we can do it for a longer and longer period of time, we can see how closely related the breath is to all of these internal processes that are happening. And we can start to dissect what's happening there and start to move into the internal territory of our own well-being. I think that this is, uh, it's, a, it's a strange thing to try to discuss. Uh, it's something that a person has to do themselves, they have to experience directly. Um, but I still continue to encourage you to try to do that. I think it's very worthwhile. I think that it's very interesting, if nothing else, um, once we start to see what are the true markers of our well being? How are we actually doing? Poor or rich, um, well educated or illiterate? Our true well-being is observable really only to us and um, takes time, but it's worthwhile. I will leave you with that. I apologize if it was, this was a bit long today. Um, 
I hope that you are all taking care of yourselves, and I do hope that taking care of yourselves involves a bit of Anapan twice a day. I hope you're taking care of everyone around you, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.